Welcome to our CreConnect series where we aim to get answers to all your burning cardiovascular questions about health and lifestyle related. This week we're here with Norma Cables. Norma is heart failure clinical nurse specialist and national nurse lead for the heart failure program in Ireland. Norma is going to answer your questions on heart failure today. So thank you for joining us Norma. Um, so we hear from many patients that there's a huge lack of awareness and understanding of heart failure. And in many cases, you know, it never gets named even, despite them having symptoms and that and being on treatment. So you can imagine that it's very frightening for people. So I'm going to jump in straight away. So to begin with, we have a really good question from Catherine in Mayo. And she's just been told that she has heart failure and wants to know what does this mean? So thank you to yourself, Patricia, and to Cree for inviting me here today. I'm delighted with the opportunity of promoting awareness and heart failure. I agree that when a lot of patients, when I'm in clinic, when they come in and they've been told they have a diagnosis of heart failure, they're frightened and they're anxious because they don't really understand what the term means. They think that the whole heart is failing or else they think that only a percentage of the heart is actually functioning. So that's not what it means. So the heart, like any pump, has got two functions. One, where it squeezes and pumps the blood forward. And the second then is when it relaxes and refills with blood, getting it ready for the next phase of pumping and squeezing forward again. So in both those states, either the pumping and squeezing or the relaxing, if that isn't working correctly, then a person may develop heart failure. So the blood isn't getting moved forward like it should, and basically you're getting a backlog or a buildup behind that, which we call congestion. That buildup can go up into the lungs and cause breathlessness, or that buildup can go down through the body and start causing oedema or swelling around the legs. So the, the term heart failure basically means that there's a decline in the efficiency of the heart pump. Sometimes when the percentage comes in, is that when the heart be squeezing, pumping the blood forward, there's a test called an echo or an ultrasound of your heart. And that's actually measuring how much of the volume is pumped forward. So the normal is 50 to 70%. And if it's below that, the doctor might say, oh, your heart function is 20%. But the person might think, oh my God, my whole heart is only functioning at 20%. Where what it means is that only 20% of the volume within the blood is pushed forward but the heart will never pump forward 100% because it needs to leave blood back inside the heart to get it primed again for the next filling stage. So 50 to 70%, that's normal. Okay, thank you for that. That's great. Um, and on that then as well, Michael has called us. He's cocooning at home and he's giving a lot of thought to his health at the moment. So he wants to know what are the causes of heart failure? He says he's had high blood pressure for years and could, could he develop heart failure or what, what causes it? Yes, there's a lot of causes and um, high blood pressure or hypertension is certainly one of the causes. And unfortunately, hypertension or high blood pressure isn't adequately controlled. So if you have got blood pressure that, and you have started on medication, it is very important that you get regular checks done of your blood pressure to ensure that the control is good. I think one of the great things in heart failure is, is there's a lot of things we can do to actually prevent heart failure. So that would be the goal of trying to achieve is prevention of it. So other causes and risks are like cardiovascular disease, and that's where you've got a buildup of plaque within the arteries of the blood vessels of the heart itself. And what the whole point of the blood being pumped forward is that each cell in the body needs to oxygen and nutrients from the blood in order to work properly. So if the heart muscle itself is getting a reduced blood supply because of this narrowing in the blood vessels, then the heart muscle isn't going to work properly and you are at risk of developing heart failure. And the same then if you go on and develop a heart attack, the heart wall gets damaged as well. Lifestyle as well has an influence and that would be with obesity and lack of exercise, um, the hypertension that we also uh, mentioned there, and also with diabetes. Okay. So taking all these into account, it's keeping all these things under control that will help your risk of heart failure be lowered. 
That's really helpful. Thank you. And, and hopefully Michael will, will get some tips there around that. And you mentioned symptoms, Norma. Can you explain what particular symptoms there are of heart failure that people can watch out for? Yes. So there's kind of like two groups, Patricia. There's a group of people who have signs and symptoms of heart failure and who are not diagnosed with heart failure. And the other group then are people who have a diagnosis with heart failure. And so both lots will have similar symptoms. So the group I'll talk about first, the people who haven't got a diagnosis yet. So heart failure is very much, we'll say, for higher risk with people who are older, usually older than 65. People who in um, mid-range age, uh, we'll say due to lifestyle of maybe not taking in much exercise, of high salt diet, eating a lot of processed food, overweight, the relaxing part of their heart, the muscle becomes more stiff. So they're also at risk of getting heart failure. So if they have signs and symptoms of breathlessness, and with that, they could have an ongoing cough that seems to be persistent. A lot of people would end up that they've gone to the GP a few times thinking they've got a chest infection. Fatigue is a big thing. Because you're carrying extra fluids, your body isn't functioning normally, people have the sensation of slowing down. And I find with older people that they might contribute that to their age. They say, I'm getting older, I must be slowing down. But I wouldn't, I would strongly stress that get these symptoms reviewed. The other thing, as I said then, is that you might suddenly find that your legs are beginning to swell or that your tummy is beginning to swell, that your trousers don't fit you properly anymore. And the other one as well is that waking up at night time. Now I have a little bottle here that you can see and that if there was fluid, as I was saying, like congestion back in your lungs, the fluid would be like the water here in the bottle. I call it the pink just to make it a little bit easier to see. Yeah. So when you're upright, fluid will always go down with gravity, so down to the bottom of your lungs. But when you lie down in bed at night time, as you can see, the fluid goes all over the surface. And that takes about an hour to happen. And what happens with people is that they wake up from their sleep feeling they're suffocating or they can't breathe. Now, that is a really important sign of that you might have heart failure. So if you've got signs of breathlessness, with or without a cough, fatigue, you feel you're slowing down, any swelling of the ankles, or you've been waking up at night feeling, I can't breathe right, that's when you need to go to your GP and get checked out. For those who already have a diagnosis of heart failure, we would recommend that you weigh yourself every morning. And this is really important. The importance of that is, as I say, when the heart pump doesn't work properly, you get a backlog of congestion. So you're retaining fluid in the body. As you're retaining fluid, your weight goes up. And it's the sudden rising in weight that we're looking out for. So that sometimes people be the same weight every morning and they'd say, God, you're on the same weight every morning. Why? Why do I have to do this? And kind of, but it's so important because that's what's going to keep you well. It's been shown that when weight goes up, maybe about two weeks later, you start getting the symptoms. So now we have an opportunity to get in there with medication, adjust what's going on, figure out why is this happening, and basically avoid you having to come to hospital if possible. And it makes also makes then that you're well for a longer period of time and and. That's the goal of it. So that would be the self-care. That's what we'd be looking out for, as well as the breathlessness, the swelling of the legs, or any dizziness or fatigue. Okay, that's really clear. Thank you so much for that. And your, your bottle demonstrating <laughs> the fluid yeah. just makes it more visual for people to understand that. So that's really, really clear. Thank you. And what you've described there now links in very much to our next question. So, so Pat, obviously, has heart failure, he's on treatment, but he's asking about the water tablets. He's on water tablets and they make it very difficult for him to go on the bus because obviously he feels, he, he, he's afraid that he may need to, to, to go suddenly. And similarly for people maybe looking after people with, with heart failure um, that maybe have mobility issues. Yes. What sort of things do you suggest around managing the diuretics? I totally understand what he's saying. I think diuretics are the vein of everybody's life. They are very difficult medication. They, they were the first medication that was used for heart failure. They were the only things that were available initially. And the, 
I think it's important to understand why you're taking them. So why you're taking them is, as I was saying, when the heart isn't pumping properly, there's going to be a buildup of a backlog of congestion of fluid. So that puts a strain and a stress on the body. The water tablets are used to reduce this volume buildup inside the body. So then that reduces the stress on the body and allows the heart then to pump a little bit easier. So usually when you take the tablets, they start working within 30 minutes. And the answer the gap goes on then for maybe about two or three hours. So it's important that if there's something going on, like an appointment or you're going on a trip, that you plan out your day of when you actually take the tablets. To miss one the odd time is okay, but to start missing them on a regular basis is actually detrimental to your, to your heart and your body. The other medication that you're on, you're not going to get the same benefit because you're not allowing that volume buildup to be reduced down by your water tablet. Now, what I would recommend is that you do everything possible to make sure you're on the least amount of water tablet that you need to be on. So basically, if you eat a diet high in salt, now some people just check with your doctor that this is okay, but some people might have low salt levels. But in general, if you eat a high salt diet, that kind of counteracts what the water tablet is doing. Salt holds on to fluid. So then you go back to the doctor, you're not seeming to get rid of the fluid, and what he'll do is he'll increase your water tablets. So if you ensure that you're eating the right food, that'll ensure you're only on the water tablets that you need to be on. Then you might be on tablet maybe one in the morning or one in the afternoon, and that's like you're going to the toilet in a lot all day long. So just chat with the doctor, tell him, could you take the two water tablets together? And in some cases that can be done. So if there's any issues or problems, you talk to the doctor about it. There's two main types of water tablets that we use. And one is called Fruzamide or Lasix. And the other one is Burenix or Bumetanide. Now, food affects Fruzamide or Lasix more than what it does for the Bumetanide. So in order to get the best benefit out of the Fruzamide, you should really take it on an empty stomach an hour before food or maybe two hours after having food. And that will ensure then that you're only on the minimum amount of water tablets you need to be on. If it's somebody who's elderly and that their mobility isn't great, if it's a, a man and he's at home, I'd recommend purchasing things like urinal, that he'd have the comfort and dignity in his own home of being able to pass water without having to rush out to the toilet. Or if it's somebody who needs a little hand, that if the carer or the family support is there, that they know this tablet is going to start working in half an hour and that the person has support to bring them out to the bathroom if needed. So basically, it's planning out your day and ensuring you're eating the right food. Some people will be telling me that they drink a lot because they're getting thirsty. Now, that might be a sign that you're on too many water tablets. So if you find you're getting very thirsty, which is a sign of dehydration, I'd also be chatting to the GP because the amount of tablets that you're put on initially will always be changed. It'll always be tweaked. The condition of where you are now, maybe your heart function improves and you don't need that amount of water tablets. So keep checking um, with your GP that you're on the right amount of medication on a regular basis. Thanks, Norma. That's some really good advice now for Pat and also for anybody caring with some, for somebody with maybe mobility issues or that. So really good advice. Uh, next question is from Brendan, who's also on treatment for heart failure, but his concern is that his doctor has given him beta blockers and has mm -hmm. told him that they are good for his heart. But since he started taking them, he's feeling very tired all the time. He's also mentioned something about having wild or awful dreams. And he wants to know, should he take them? So obviously you're going to say that, but any advice around that? Yes, what beta blockers actually do. So as I said, the heart being a pump. So when the heart squeezes and pumps the blood forward, if when the heart relaxes and opens up, if it can open up as much as it can, it will fill more. So if the heart is going too fast, then it's harder for the heart to fill properly. So what we're using the beta blockers for is to slow down your heart rate. It also can lower down your blood pressure, but in heart failure, we're using it to slow down your heart rate to allow your heart to fill better. So then your heart will work with a better pump. Initially, when people are put on this medication, 
that they might find changes, that they might find they're actually tired, and it takes maybe about a week or two for your body to adjust to the medication. So if you're new to the medication, just stay with it for a week or two. If, if the symptoms are very mild and they're not causing you any great difficulties, but if they continue to talk to your doctor, the new beta blockers nowadays don't usually cause any nightmares and other tablets can, like statins. So my first advice is never stop medication. Because if you stop medication, especially like beta blockers, you get this thing called a rebound um, heart rate. And what that means is your heart rate goes up really high because suddenly this medication is gone. So if your heart is going too fast, then the, the filling of the heart has got really reduced and you could suddenly start developing congestive heart failure. So other times symptoms might be cause of something else that might be going on. It might just happen that you started on the medication. So for things like tiredness, you might be anemic. That's very common with people with heart failure. So you go to your GP, any issues, go to your GP or your heart failure nurse. Tell them your issues and concerns because that's what we want to hear. We want to hear how can we adjust medication to make you feel as well as possible. Thank you. Again, some really good advice there. And for sure, you know, the bottom line is don't, don't just stop taking your tablets. Have that conversation. Mm. Great. So what about activity then, Norma? Is, is exercise, like we hear about exercise being important for all of us. So is it important for people with heart failure? And, and in that situation, how do we ensure that it's, it's performed correctly and safely? Yes. Exercise, I can't begin to say how beneficial exercise is. I heard it in a lecture once that if they could put the benefits of exercise into a pill, it would be a bestseller. So exercise is so important for both prevention of heart failure and also for people with heart failure. What it actually does exercise in heart failure is that that stiffening of the heart muscle, it allows it to relax more so the heart can feel better. Exercise also creates your blood vessel to open up more, so you get more of a delivery of blood around to all the body, so your cells get more of a blood supply, so your body can function better. So a lot of centers have um, programs called cardiac rehab, and these are specially designed exercise programs for people with cardiac diseases, and that would include heart failure. So I'd recommend that going asking your GP or your heart failure nurse in the hospital is there such a program available? At the moment with COVID, the cardiac rehab programs, they have, they have switched to doing kind of online advice and that they're adjusting as well, but that they're still there. They're still there to give out advice on what to do. Anybody with any medical condition should always get medical advice before they'd engage into exercise. It's because you have to ensure that your heart rate is okay, that it isn't too high or too low, that your blood pressure isn't too high or too low because that then will cause other side effects that you don't want. So exercise is very important and a little is better than no exercise. So I know there's, there's recommended minutes of 30 to 45 minutes, but if people only did a few minutes every day, that all builds up as well. But before you start, get that medical advice and make sure you're doing it correctly and safely. Great. Again, some really good advice there uh, for us. Thank you. Um, we're big believers of exercise in heart disease for sure ourselves. Yeah. So, so finally then with, with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and, and you talked about the heart failure services, ha has there been a reduced access and, uh, to the services and the heart failure nurse specialists? Have they, you know, have staff been redeployed or, you know, with the postponement of services? Mm -hmm. Has that been an issue? Because people are asking you like, if they need to have a blood test or, or if they're due to have a, a checkup, what, how should they do that or, or what's happening with the service? Yes. So yes, definitely COVID-19 did have an impact, I think, on all services in Ireland. Um, in the heart failure nurse specialists, there was just over 26% of reduction in the nurses, but that does not mean that those 26% of the heart failure services shut down. There was a lot of services. There were there was three, two and three nurses, and maybe one was redeployed to a coronary care unit. 
but that there were still nurses remaining behind. And what we took to, we weren't able to do regular face-to-face follow-up clinics, but we were contacting and ringing patients. But what I really want to get out is that the heart failure services are still open and that we want people to contact us. We're, de- we're ringing people as much as we can, but we're dependent on people to ring us too. It is so important that if you're not feeling well, that you either contact us or contact your GP. This is when we can actually adjust medication, find out what's going on, and actually avoid you having to come into hospital. And, and the main aim is that we get you well as quickly as possible. So that's a really clear message I want to get out there now, is that we're open for business, that we're there and we're up, we can be contacted. So use the telephone contacts that your heart failure nurse has given you. If there needs to be blood tests done, or if we do need to see you, we all have plans put in place that we can safely do this. So you're not going to be exposed to COVID-19. We've, we've gone with um, recommendations from our infection control people in the hospital and plus with HSE recommendations. So we have everything as safe as possible. So we take good care that you will hopefully won't end up contracting any viruses, but it is so important to contact us and and let us know if you're not well. Great. That that's really reassuring for people because I suppose that's the concern. They don't there's the fear of contracting COVID nineteen, yeah. but there's also not wanting to be a burden on the, the, the services as well. Mm, totally. Yeah. I'm hearing that all the time. That you drink you drink patients and um like we're at the moment we're ringing about 80 to 100 patients a week um, where I work. So in that group of people, every week we'll find people who've actually got signs and symptoms of heart failure. And you'd say, gosh, did you not think of ringing us? And they'd say, but you're very busy. Your time is taken up. But it's not. Our service is there to provide a heart failure service for people. That's the service we're providing. So we need people we're relying on people to actually contact us and let us know. Now, people have been told that if you've got cardiovascular or heart problems, you're at high risk, you're vulnerable. They've all been cocooning. Yeah. And that makes an extra layer of anxiety and people being scared about going to clinics as well. But as I said, we're t- we've taken all the measures that we've been told to. So a lot is done by telephone, but if the need comes that we do need, or even if we have to need to admit you into the hospital, we have very safe pathways of doing that. that that's really reassuring for people, I think. And I, I suppose that's a, you know, a really key message that, that we need to get across. So, so you know, finally then, I'll give you, can I give you the last word on that? Do you have <laughs> anything further that you want to say? The... the main thing that I want to say is that if there is anybody out there who seems to have signs and symptoms of heart failure, you can look up on the internet that there's loads of stuff there that will tell you what the signs and symptoms of heart failure and the main ones being the breathlessness, with or without a cough, the fatigue, the swelling of your legs. There's other reasons why this might be going on, but not to think that, have the thought that this might be heart failure especially if you're after having a heart attack, if you're older than 65, if you've got other risk factors like diabetes or hypertension, just bear in mind, I wonder, is this heart failure? Because the sooner you can start on on medication for heart failure, then the sooner you're going to feel well, your heart function then will get a chance to recover as well as possible, and that you will have a longer and better quality of life as a result of it. And for those who have heart failure, if they feel that their condition is deteriorating, we're here. The heart failure nurses are here. We're open for business. And we'd only be delighted to hear from you all. So we'd welcome those phone calls. That's really great, Norma. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Creep Connects. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks' time. And at that stage, we'll be answering your questions around obesity. So get your questions into us now, visit cree.ie or you can call us on 091-544-310. Don't forget to stay tuned to our website for lots of great resources, including lots of information around heart failure that Norma mentioned.
Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You can find us at Cree Heartstroke. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.